the mechanisms of nucleophilic acyl substitution, and there are three of them. And the first two aren't bad. We're going to do one uh, for base catalyzed or the presence of a strong nucleophile. We're going to do uncatalyzed when you've got a neutral nucleophile. And then we're going to do acid catalyzed, and that's the one that's going to kind of suck a little bit. So we are going to explicitly show all the arrow pushing, though, for all three. Now, this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so we're going to start off with base catalyzed, and that's what I referred to it in the last lesson. So uh, you can also be referred to it as one in the presence of a strong nucleophile here. And so I'm going to start us off with an acid chloride, and the strong nucleophile or base catalyzed, this is the easiest of those three mechanisms. And here we're going to add the appropriate alkoxide to form the ester of choice, in this case, a methyl ester. Uh, in this case, first step is just nucleophilic attack. We'll find out they're only going to have two steps. So, but nucleophilic attack, push the electrons up. Notice that's exactly how nucleophilic addition started off with, with ketones and aldehydes. All right, so you get this lovely intermediate. We'll find out that we often refer to this as the tetrahedral intermediate. We'll see why in a second. So if we were doing this with a ketone or an aldehyde, we'd simply just protonate this oxygen and that would be completing the nucleophilic addition reaction. So, but in this case, we're doing substitution and the key difference here is that we have something with a leaving group. Ketones and aldehydes, carbons and hydrogens, there's no leaving group there. And so you couldn't actually do what we're about to do, but we're gonna bring these electrons right back down and force chlorine to leave. Cool, and that is the entire mechanism. Now notice we said we talked about the uh, intermediate here as being the tetrahedral intermediate. And the reason it gets pointed out as being tetrahedral is that your reactant is sp2 hybridized trigonal planar, your product's sp2 hybridized and trigonal planar, but the intermediate is indeed sp3 hybridized carbon right there and tetrahedral. So that's why that gets pointed out that way. Now you might be like, well, Chad, why does this happen in, in two steps like this? Why can't we just like do backside attack? Well, we know we don't do backside attack on sp2 carbons. We can either with this, this thing being trigonal planar, we can attack the front face or the back face. So in this case, and it just turns out when we study the kinetics, it turns out to be two steps, just like we propose uh, and show right here. So, uh, but again, this is the easiest of the mechanisms. Uh, this is the base catalyzed. Let's take a look at the uncatalyzed mechanism as well. All right, so here, instead of using methoxide ion and with an anion being a, a, a strong nucleophile, here I've got the neutral nucleophile in methanol. And again, with an acid chloride or an acid anhydride, you don't actually have to catalyze this. Now, it turns out with the acid chloride that we're going to get a lot better yield with this if we actually put a weak base in the solution with this. And so sometimes you'll see this written out explicitly like, like I'm about to, but oftentimes you wouldn't. But in this case, I'm going to use pyridine as my weak base. And again, some you'll often see this written without including this whatsoever. In fact, on my big chart, I didn't include it either. So, but with an acid chloride and a neutral nucleophile, so we're going to find out that it, it works a lot better if we do have this weak base present in the solution. So, all right, so this is going to start off very similar to what we saw here. So we're going to have nucleophilic attack, push the pi electrons up. Still form a tetrahedral intermediate here. All right. And these electrons, once again, are going to come right back down and push off the chloride. All right, now it turns out if we had anything other than chloride that had been the leaving group, it would be a strong enough base just to come and deprotonate this. So, but chloride, if it comes and deprotonates, forms HCl. And again, HCl is a strong acid, evidence that chloride's a super, super weak base. And that's why this is gonna work better if we have a weak base like pyridine in there. And so here, I'm gonna use that pyridine to come and deprotonate and get us to our final product here. So we're going to get our ester there, and then if I draw the mechanism explicitly here, I'll show the pyridine protonated as a product 
as well. Cool. And that is the entire mechanism for the uncatalyzed. So notice we went from two steps in the base catalyzed mechanism to three steps in the uncatalyzed with one extra deprotonation. So, and like I said though, we're about to do the acid catalyzed and it's gonna be six steps and you're gonna hate it to a certain extent, but it is something you are probably in all likelihood on the hook for. So now we'll take a look at this acid catalyzed mechanism. And like I said, it's gonna be six steps long. It's also gonna be very reminiscent with what we saw with like uh, hemiacetals, acetals, uh, imines, enamines, a lot of this kind of thing. And again, big thing here is if you want a good leaving group, you'll often protonate it to turn it into a good leaving group like we saw with alcohols and stuff. And if something looks like a good leaving group but you want it to stay, like you just added it, so you want it to stay, you'll typically deprotonate it. So we got a lot of uh, proton transfer. So a lot of protonating and deprotonating along the way in these mechanisms. So and being able to predict when they happen and stuff like that, super important. But six steps and you really do need to get this down. But if you've already got the patterns down for imines, enamines, uh, acetals, things of that sort, you're probably not gonna struggle with this too badly either. All right, so here we're going to do the hydrolysis of an ester, so acid catalyzed hydrolysis of an ester here. So I've drawn out uh, one of our H3O plus ions here, and first up, it turns out uh, you've got, uh, in this case, also water in there. So and why don't I draw a water molecule in here for the fun of it too. So, but you put acid in water. So if you need an acid, it's H3O plus. If you need a base, it's water. And the best nucleophile you have in the solution is water, which is not a great nucleophile. And so in this case, if we had an acid chloride uh, or, or acid halide in general or an acid anhydride, we wouldn't need an acid catalyst here. So, but because we've got something less reactive in ester in this case, we have to either do acid or base catalyzed. So I could have used methoxide and that would have been the base catalyzed mechanism. It would have been two steps and life would have been good. So, but in this case, um, we're doing acid catalyzed and it's again gonna be six steps. So in this case, water is not a good enough nucleophile to react with our ester. So it turns out what's gonna happen first then is we're gonna protonate the carbonyl oxygen of our ester. All right, now that it's protonated, our carbonyl carbon has a significantly greater amount of partial positive charge, so much more polar bond here than it was here. And now water says, oh, I can react with you. I couldn't react with the original ester, but I can totally react with you. You have an, a significant amount of partial positive charge in comparison to what you did. So, and more significant, now I can, I can react. And so now water's gonna come in and do nucleophilic attack. And I'm actually gonna do it on this side. Didn't really matter, but I trying to keep consistent with what I've done in other reactions here. All right, so now we've got this lovely OH bond, that's that guy. So, and then we've attached a water molecule. So, and then we have this OCH3. Now let's keep in mind where we're heading. If you add H3O plus to any carboxylic acid derivative, you're gonna end up with a carboxylic acid. And so in the end, we are headed for this lovely carboxylic acid. And the question is, how do we get there? So in this case, if you notice then, that OCH3 is gonna to need to leave. So, and then this guy's gonna to need to stay. And so in this case, if you look at the focus on the most reactive thing you have, it's got a positive formal charge there. That's the most reactive thing we have. And that's the water molecule that just attached. And if it just attached, I want it to stay. But notice it's still a water molecule. It's, it's or at least it's a water that's attached. It's a good leaving group. Well, if it's a good leaving group, but I don't want it to leave, well then deprotonate it. And if you're gonna deprotonate, water is your base. If you're gonna protonate, H2O plus your acid, whenever you need one. And so in this case, we'll draw in another water molecule. and simply deprotonate this guy. All right, and then we also formed a hydronium ion. I'll draw one of those out. And so now there's nothing particularly reactive about this species. So, and the truth is I should have been showing this all the way through, but this is in equilibrium conditions all the way through, my bad. So nothing particularly reactive about this thing, but we're gonna keep in mind where we're headed. And again, we're going for that carboxylic acid. Well, 
that OCH3 needs to leave, but it's not a good leaving group. If it left, it would be an alkoxide ion, a very strong base, not a good leaving group. And so what do you do when you have something you want to leave that's not a good leaving group? You protonate it. And that's what we're gonna do. And we'll do it with our hydronium ion here. formed a water molecule as well. Okay, so we are one, two, three, four steps into this, two steps left. And now that you've got a good leaving group, you're going to have it leave. So, and this is gonna be a common pattern. The moment you turn something into a good leaving group to make it leave, next step, it's gonna leave. That's gonna happen here. So, and in this case, you're gonna form a resonant stabilized carbocation, except more commonly, rather than showing both resonant structures, just like we saw with like acetal formation, we're just gonna push these electrons back down and have the positive formal charge on the oxygen instead of on the carbon instead, and often show just that one major resonance contributor. Now that's what we're gonna do here. Okay, so this oxygen right here is the one we just formed the double bond with right there. And then we also have this OH still attached as well. And then we had methanol just up and leave. All right, and from here, we're almost to our final product here. We just need to simply deprotonate this guy and we're done. And we'll just use, you know, a water molecule in. I can use that one or I can draw another one in. I'll just draw another one in. Cool, we don't need this guy anymore now that we've got our final product. So, but that's the entire mechanism. And notice we formed H3O plus at the end. We regenerated the original catalyst. It's not consumed like a true catalyst shouldn't be consumed. Cool, but there's your six steps. And notice we started with an ester, end up with a carboxylic acid. If we went in reverse, if we took this carboxylic acid, so, and added alcohol and acid, we could actually do the reverse process and form the ester, and that would be the Fischer esterification. And that one's important enough that when we get to the, uh, the, the lesson on esters, I'm actually gonna work that mechanism out. And it, again, it really is just the reverse of this, but it's, I feel like it's worth the time to explicitly work that one out because it shows up commonly enough. So when we get to the uh, lesson on esters, we will totally go through that mechanism as well. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you are looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems on carboxylic acids and their derivatives, if you're looking for my brand new OCHEM 2 final exam rapid reviews, already finished the OCHEM 1 final exam rapid reviews last semester, but releasing the OCHEM 2 ones as we speak, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. They are all included.